This is the Verify Testing uh, Think Big update uh, for February 2021. I thought it'd be a good time since we've gone uh, six, seven, eight months almost probably um, of doing Think Bigs to look back at some of those, look at the outcomes uh, that we wanted to get, what our Think Small resulted in, what the smallest thing was, what the progress was since then, um, just to kind of calibrate, see where we're at. Um, and see if these are worthwhile for us. Uh, if we want to continue to do these, take this synchronous time as a team. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and the doc. And so these are in chronological order um, from what I could find, starting with our Think Big Around test history in July. Um, I'm just going to do a quick readout here, uh, but everyone can definitely read through the text on their own. Um, and then we'll take them one by one and just talk about were these the outcomes that we wanted um, and what might be the next possible thing, uh, just building on what I have there, the next, what's the next thing towards the big vision. Um, so I have the links here for back to the issue itself uh, in our board, the agenda doc that we had. Uh, just to recap, our big vision was providing actionable suggestions about tests that might be slow or flaky based on past performance, tips in the IDE about how to write those kinds of tests. That's what we think this could eventually become. Um, our next small thing was sorting tests in our unit test report by failure and then by time so that someone could easily identify that the slowest tests of the failed tests were on top. That might be indicative of a test that is flaky. Uh, since then, we've also added in our test um, repeat test counter uh, MVC. So that shows up now in this view as well. We wanted to increase views of that test report on .com by 10% within 30 days of release. Uh, we don't actually have any tracking for that though. Um, so while that was an ambitious goal, who knows if we actually got there. Um, we have seen that there are more pipelines being created and ran that have JUnit test data uploaded to them on .com as a, a growth number than just the overall pipeline growth. Um, so more people are using these features potentially, or at least uploading data that can make them use the features. Um, our next test, next step was adding that test, read MV, test history MVC into the unit test report, which we have done. Uh, and then project level report would be coming after that to help show these flaky and slow tests. So I think we're in a good spot on this. We've made good progress. And I think that for me, our discussion on Think Big, Think Small was really helpful in understanding what would be helpful for, to the developer and the team persona when it comes to this problem. What do you all think? Love to hear somebody else talk this on me. Ricky, I see a raised hand. Yeah, I tried to I tried to physically raise my hand, but I remember that there's a button for that now. So I mean, save the calories. Uh, we, we've had some good conversations in, in this area with te uh, engineering productivity uh, ar around the data that we're collecting for the test history MVC. And it seems like the next logical um, outcome because we've now seen the growth of that table and we know how worried we need to be about the growth of that table and the size of that table and what we're putting in that table. And it turns out that we don't really have to be that worried about it. So we can probably stuff the whole uh, test name in there, which would open up a bunch of other doors for engineering productivity to attract flaky tests. And I think that gets us um, really well positioned for the project level report. Because uh, if we can start showing, if we can start showing the list of tests and how many times they failed in the default pipeline over a certain period of time, then that's ample data to to create a new page uh, and, and talk about specific tests that are are uh, important or or failing or might be flaky, and and I, I think that that is is a logical kind of progression. Uh, for, for this feature. And I, uh, I think the think bigs have been super useful in this regard because we get we get all those people in a room, right? Oh, a digital room. We get Kyle and the engineering productivity team and uh, sometimes Mac and Joanna from quality team. And we, we can talk about uh, what they'd like to see. And so I, I think that 
uh, there's a lot of things that we can do with this. And I'm, I'm excited to keep, keep plugging away. Agreed. I'm trying to catch up on notes, but I think I missed a chunk of what you said about next iteration on the feature, but that's why we're recording this. Scott, anything to add there? Uh, nothing profound. It was just, it is really cool to see what we actually accomplished based on that think big and think small. Yeah. I mean, I've been cheating a little bit and picking think bigs that fit into a little bit of the existing roadmap, but I think that they are turning into better issues after our discussion. And that's a relatively cheap way for us to iterate quickly uh, through an hour of discussion and an hour of follow up. Um, versus building something, launching it, and then waiting for a feedback cycle. Cool. All right. I'm going to keep moving down if we're wrapped up on that one. All right. I'm going to share my screen again just so we can all look at it. Uh, the next topic that we talked about, this was in July and August, uh, was around user-defined MR widgets. Um, issue, the agenda link. Ultimately, what we thought the big vision where we could end up was a WYSIWYG type editor where admins could build their own widgets on their instance, um, decide which information appears, and decide a threshold for actually failing a pipeline or blocking an MR from that data. Our next smallest thing was just use uh, a blog post to better socialize how you can integrate with the merge request API, leave comments, um, some of the other um, existing functionality that we have. Yeah, using expose as MR comments, custom metrics um, to get more context out of your pipeline into an MR. Uh, that hasn't been done. And so the next thing is still that thing, uh, but we haven't made much for progress. Ricky, what's up? I was just thinking about this in a kind of hacky frame of mind. And, and I was wondering about uh, because we define our own code quality rules and you can kind of just upload your JSON and it'll show up in the code quality widget. Someone could theoretically, you know, parse their unit test report results with their own application and then upload it in the code quality format. And then they could have a custom widget that's really just a code quality widget that would surface those um, pieces like that. That'd be kind of neat. Uh, then you could kind of consolidate all your widgets down to just one through the code quality report format, but you'd have to do like a decent amount of programming and you'd probably have to figure out, okay, well, this is a minor issue. This is a crit. And, well, it's kind of neat that you get that ability to be like, okay, this unit test failing is a critical issue, but this uh, security scan throwing an error is just an info. And then kind of, I don't know, that, that's kind of an interesting idea. Yeah, that's uh, it's definitely something that we've already started to talk about with that future issue around blocking merge with the code quality degradation um, and why that would stay at an ultimate um, because there's lots of possibility to work around some of the existing ultimate functionality there. But that's, I think, a really interesting other use case or tangent. Um, adjacent use case is the right um, word, I think, to mangle that data into something else and display it in code quality. Um, as long as you understand the JSON format, I mean, you can stick anything in there and upload it. That works just fine. It's, it's, it's similar to the conversations that we've had around the coverage uh, YAML entry where it, sure, it's probably supposed to be unit test code coverage. That doesn't mean that everyone is using it that way. Yep, yep. Bending things to your use case uh, is a common use case, I think, right? I will make this tool work for me. Yeah, that XKCD, XKCD already did it. Yeah. Well, I don't, I think that our next smallest thing is still the next thing here. Um, we're not making, or we haven't done anything really with the Chex API. We haven't done anything down this road. It's not, um, or down this path. It's not something that we have a ton of users clamoring for today that we don't already have plans for. 
and we have plenty of use cases and other bits of functionality that we want to go solve. Um, There's a decent amount of people who are interested in the checks API from what I yeah. remember, like the, that, that gets a lot of traction that issue, but um, it, it's also like a weird uh, feature because it doesn't neatly fall into our groups um, yeah. slice of GitLab. So I'm not, not that that's a problem. It's just, it, it, it kind of makes it more difficult to prioritize. Agreed. Any, anything else to discuss on this one? Are we still okay with our next smallest thing? Thumbs up. General nodding. All right. Cool. Move on. Let's talk about code quality then. That was the next thing we talked through. So in September, we brought up code quality. Um, our big vision, the ideal outcome, was a totally customizable dashboard. Uh, for users that they could use to identify risky bits of the code base. Um, that got reflected into the code quality direction page. Uh, so I had an MR that I opened up for that. Which I think, no, I didn't link in this one. In the code testing and coverage, I linked to one of our Think Bigs, um, the YouTube video of it to discuss it. Um, but it is a bit uh, reflected in our vision design that we have here. Um, our next smallest thing, uh, ignoring the rules with severity, uh, that helps customize that experience for someone. If they don't want any of those info things, then they should be able to just filter them out. It should be configurable for them. By default, we just show everything, which is fine. Um, and right now that's scheduled for 14.2. Believe that our success measures are an increase in views in the code quality report because that report gets more usable uh, with that feature in place. And we do now have tracking for that, yay. So opening it up for discussion, is our next small thing still the right thing for our vision? Should we prioritize, should we think about prioritizing something else that is even smaller uh, from an MVC perspective that gets us towards that big vision or that can help us validate that we're going the right way? I think the smallest thing makes sense. Uh, figuring out how we can just basically ignore certain certain topics. I think the challenge there is where are we going to put that config, right? Yeah. Um, we could add another GitLab CI YAML variable. We know how people love having lots of those. So, uh, but I, I think that's actually what I've suggested in the proposal is. Did I add a variable? Yeah, add a variable to be passed to the code quality job that takes severity levels. Um, and then we have those levels, we know what they are, and basically set a floor for I don't want to see anything below this. Yeah. We just have to be I, clear about that. The big challenge for this slice is gonna be the like the data persistence layer and the, the data model for for moving on this. Because in order to do a lot of the things that are on the roadmap, we're gonna to have to start tracking these as logical entities in the database. Um, I, I don't really see another way that we can, you know, just continue to treat things as if they are just files and then still be able to bring the features and functionality that people expect from a tool like this. So thinking of uh, Sonar Cube, for example, where you log into the app, you there's there's a very clear uh, entity that relates to a specific warning that it's giving you and you can comment on it. You can create a JIRA issue for it. It has its own like sonar cube issue and you can have a discussion in there. You can change the priority, you can ignore it. And then that is persistent through multiple runs of the sonar cube application because it's storing that in a logical database. Um, so, so, so I think that that's going to be a challenge just because of the sheer quantity and, and making it scale for .com. Uh, we're, we're going to have to do, I think, similar types of tests as we've been doing with the unit test report right now for the failed tests. So uh, we'll have to kind of, you know, see how big it is and then and figure out what we can do from there. Yeah. I wonder, um, we don't have an epic or issues worked up for that yet, but once we start, we want to think about what is what's the smallest thing we can scope down to tracking while we persist an issue at 
I would say on the default branch, like here's your default branch, here's all the issues that we found on it. What's the next piece of metadata that you want to track for that? Um, or what's the even the smallest piece, even if it's not the best piece, what can we start to persist in the database just to test out what the growth is going to be like, knowing what additional metadata we might have and that would look like maybe. Be yeah, I think ponder. I think we could get like a good um, idea about this by doing the same kind of thing we did with the HLL counts on how many what, what how many tests are run because we, we have that metric now. We could do a similar result where it's just like, well, how many code quality infractions are there on the on every instance? And, and that would give us a good kind of uh, heuristic for how we can approach this. And then and then we could do the same kind of thing where we pick, like you said, we pick the MVC that's small and then we make we throw it in a table with uh, the intention of not feeling bad if we have to get rid of it. Uh, and then and then kind of move forward from there because it, it turns out that we don't we didn't have to be as worried as we thought we would have to be about the, the unit test ones. So um, maybe maybe it'll be the same type of situation. Yeah, I think secure is going to have some interesting information for us as well because they already do this with the security dashboard where they can track. I believe you can track an issue found in security to a GitLab issue and th that linkage stays there. And then all, everything else happens on the issue. So we don't have to worry about storing comments or anything like that in some new bespoke um, thing. It just lives in a GitLab issue and we'll tie it to that. Um, yeah, hopefully they came up with some good kind of generic approaches to that that we can just use. If not, uh, we, we may have to be the team that comes up with the, that kind of generic uh, modeling. Yeah, that's our jam though. That's what we like to do. Cool. Um, awesome. Yeah, I like where we're at with this one and moving forward still. Uh, I know it's taken us a while to get through some of the group code coverage and other whatnot, but I'm excited that we're moving forward this code quality work next. Um, that'll be a great focus for us this year. All right, moving into think big on the code coverage reports. Uh, this was our conversation in November. Um, as we've seen popularity of the test coverage visualization feature increase, we've seen a pretty dramatic bump in the number of reports that are being uploaded. Uh, so we wanted to think about what are ways that we can leverage that data, what opportunities exist. Um, our ideal outcome was that we think a developer or a team lead could use the report view, um, which you can generate HTML reports for Covertura and upload them to pages. Um, but have that actually visible in the UI without that extra step to identify gaps in code coverage, create issues to manage those gaps, even add coverage through a suggestion bot um, similar to DangerBot. That was our big vision for it. Our next smallest thing was, I forgot, oh yeah, our CI view for Covertura coverage reports. Um, and I think we even have a smaller MVC version of this as well, of taking the data generating it and putting it into the MR. Um, right now that is unscheduled, uh, but I think it's worth revisiting, seeing if that's really the next thing we should do. Um, and if there's anything we want to expand on in our big vision for that matter. Ricky, you have the first topic. Surprise, surprise. Um, so I, I was just reiterating the thing that we've talked about before, which is we should definitely consider using the Cobertura report as the source of truth for coverage when it's present uh, so that we can kind of leverage that and put, push it into the rest of our code coverage features instead of having them as two distinct entities. So we want to kind of like bring it together so people don't have to configure things in multiple places to use our features. Um, so that's, that's something I think we should just keep top of mind. Uh, it, we could even, we, there's some scenarios that we'd have to consider like what if somebody has both? Well, which one takes precedence? and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I think that doing that could avoid a lot of edge cases and, and weird scenarios that would uh, result in kind of issues or forum posts. Could that be even our next MVC for this is taking that data out of the Covertura report and displaying it somewhere on the MR saying you uploaded this report instead of just the average number that we have on the pipeline we could leave that, but we could ex do 
we could do another tool tip. Um, we could add something to the interface and we'll get Hayana to look at it because she does this way better than I do because everything is a modal when I design things. Uh, to add like the coverage by line, um, coverage by whatever the other coverage numbers are, it starts to give someone that data that they want. Uh, we've heard a lot of feedback, especially when it gets to group coverage, that they just want total lines covered versus total lines, not the average, so they can get a better sense of what the coverage numbers are. So yeah, and good I, first step. All, all that data is present in the report. The, the thing I was thinking of is let's just, if they upload a curvature report, let's put the let's put the line coverage percentage number that's in the root node of that report into our code coverage value and and just kind of go from there. So to replace what is parsed today, or if they don't have something, put it there. Both. Yeah, Both. that's what that's my thought. Yeah, it might be if they don't have something specified, just parsing it and putting it in, I think is a good MPC. That might be an even faster way it's, um, or a faster iteration than generating a UI for the report or even just adding the report to the uh, expose as list. Yeah, that seems like a pretty simple backend change. But as, as, as most backend changes, uh, it's a good chance that it might not be so simple as well. Yeah. Scott, will you verbalize your point on cluttering the pipeline page? <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the issue um, that is in the, under the smallest change um, is adding possibly adding a CI view uh, for on the pipeline page or another MR widget, probably both. Um, so my concern is just continuously adding more more tabs on that pipeline page because we're not the only ones on that page either. There's the pipeline authoring and CI team that are both adding things. We have now the DAG view, we have the test report, we have, uh, we're continuously adding more tabs. Um, there's performance concerns with that, but we can all, of course, like um, defer loading components on there until you click at a tab, but it's also like a UX thing. Like, are we overwhelming the user with so many different views on this page? Right. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it might not even be the logical spot where, where a user might think to look for that. Right. Like, cause in, in, in GitLab, we're very tied to this data model of pipelines and jobs and these reports and these things are associated with a pipeline, but when 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 a user's looking at their code, it's like, well, no, like it's it's my unit test report for my code. It's not, you know, I, unit test is a bad example. A better example is like code quality or or um, something uh, like coverage, as opposed to like it being associated with a pipeline. That just seems like once you explain it to someone, they'll be like, oh, okay, now I understand what GitLab, especially because our customer base is developers, they'll they'll pick it up and then they'll run with it and then they'll uh, like like. Uh, we were having some UX issues about where to find the group code coverage reports because it's in the analytics, like it's in repository. It's not in, in, in pipelines, which is where people are expecting because they, that's what yeah. they've come to know our data model as being, even though it like, we're trying to make it intuitive because it's about the code, but they're like, you know, overthinking it and it's thinking it's about the pipeline. So the interviews I did, every single person I think went to analytics CICD when looking for the test coverage graph and it just got worse with the group one. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, that, that wasn't the point I wrote down. But uh, the other point I wrote down was, I think that's a good call out. And a lot of our reports on that page, like code quality and test reports, I think would make more sense being pulled out from that pipeline page and being put into like a project level page where it's like, okay, this is the default report. If you want to see a report for a specific merge request, you can kind of filter it down on that page instead of going to, to the pipelines page. That, that's kind of how I would think about it. But yeah, like like we were we were talking about people who've already internalized the GitLab data model, they're already looking at clicking through to pipelines or CICD. So that, that might be a bad user experience. Yeah, and we could make a, or somehow link the pipeline to that page or something. I have the filter already narrowed down so you could see it. 
could be could be something if we wanted to go that route. I think that it's interesting to think about this at the project level first, as opposed to the pipeline level, and say, you're to utilize this, you have to run run the coverage job, get the coverage data, upload the report as part of your default pipeline to see it at the project. And you can do that scheduled, whatever. Like that's an easy way to to onboard somebody into this. But that's where the report lives. And so we're just showing it to you for whatever is the latest on your default branch. Um, it's, I mean, in part then that we can make that a premium feature for a team lead or for a director because it is that view. Um, but then we could pretty easily enable a developer to get that same data for their pipeline or for their MR, their MR and see the data that they want very contextually to their change. Hmm. Cool. Well, I think um, on, for me on this one, our, our next NBC could actually be uh, we'll write up a little issue to say parse coverage data out of um, Coverture report and utilize it if it isn't already set. That'll be interesting. We'll have to write some very specific, uh, write the proposal very specific to what happens if it is already set and if do we overwrite that. Um, but I think that that'd be a great one for someone who doesn't realize that we have the test coverage graph, the test coverage, other stuff that's out there. Um, yeah, so they can start up, up them that. in. Yeah, on by it, default. It should just work. Yeah, yeah on it should by just, default. yeah, enabled by default, right? It's one of our values. Cool. Um, well, I got as far as November. I did not get uh, our January topics covered, um, which we have done some thinking big since this uh, around the group or pulling data out of a model repo for a specific group. We do have an issue scheduled for that in the coming milestone, 1310. Uh, just a manual effort of generating a report for ourselves, for our own code um, that we touch and work on, and we'll go from there. Um, so I know we have a small sampling of the group today, but what would you all give us um, or give this a thumbs up, thumbs down as far as continuing to do think bigs at the group level? I see two thumbs up. I love it. Is our cadence okay of doing these monthly and splitting it up? Should we try to find uh, a full hour to do it all in one week as opposed to breaking it up um, and keeping with the monthly? What are your thoughts on timing? I like having it split because it gives me some time to digest it and then try and you know come up with the solution for the think small. And I like doing the think big first too. I think that makes a lot of sense, especially you know you know unconscious thinking and processing needs some time to stew. Yeah, I agree with that. Cool. Well, we'll keep it as is. Um, I'd love to see more topics uh, coming out of the group, more thumbs on these things, so it doesn't. So I'm not just picking what we talk about next. Uh, I want to make sure that the team is engaged with what we're talking about and then working on. Um, and I'll try to be more mindful and uh, conscientious about getting these things scheduled into a milestone more quickly than we have. 14.2 is pretty darn far away for something we talked about in September. That's over half a year from when we initially discussed the issue to when it'll finally get scheduled. Um, so I'll try to get for that code quality specific one. Is that right? No, sorry for the uh, code coverage one. I'll try to get that new NBC issue worked up and get it scheduled in one of our next two milestones, 13.11 or 14.0. Um, that might be a good way to re kickstart this process for us so for me as a developer what do you expect me to be doing to prepare for these think bigs am i trying to find an issue in, in our testing group uh repo yeah um i'll why don't i do this i'll record uh, a quick unfiltered video and post it of showing you where to find the issues in our team project um, and how to create one, just walk through the template real quick and add comments, add thumbs. Um, basically what I'm doing when I pick one and I'll try to give us some more time as well than just a day before. Um, the week before, look at whatever has the most thumbs that is uh, we haven't already talked through and post that. And then additional comments, additional thumbs uh, is always helpful just to get extra context for the group. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, I realize we've quickly talked around this, but I'll record a video so it's a little more out there and people can watch it and hopefully get the links into the issues. 
Awesome. We are past time. Wow. Uh, I was missed the timing on that. Um, thank you both. Great conversation as always. Uh, and I'll post this to Unfiltered for the folks you missed and want to watch so they can get a recap. Awesome. Thanks a lot, James. Thanks, Ellis.